Hi, everybody. Um, let's start. I'll skip that slide. Um, so why analytics? Uh, as you, you know, hopefully you heard from uh, Glover this morning, analytics is a very, very popular workload that comes on top of Scylla. Uh, we see it time after time, people using Scylla in conjunction with an analytic workload. And in most cases, in most cases, it involves Spark. Why Spark? Well, Spark is a very, very common framework out there in the market that people like to use. It comes from the Hadoop framework. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But I do want to give some background for people who have never touched either Scylla or Cassandra on how thing works. So if you look on a Scylla token architecture, basically we take the partitions, the actual data, and we shard it. The actual sharding happens, as you have heard before, by cores. More than that. We take the partition keys and we hash the partition key. The hashing happens in order to make sure that we distribute the data across the cluster in a very, very even way. Uh, we're using something called murmur3 hashing function to make sure that every node will have an equal number of partitions. Prevent hotspots. That's a great, um, that's a great architecture from that perspective because it guarantees that the load on each one of those nodes or those nodes is going to be equal and even. This is a simplistic uh, way of how things works because we omitted here the notion of vNodes. So people who come from the Cassandra world and Scylla world know that there's additional layer of resharding of the information inside the cluster and it might affect how it looks like. So let's dive in a little bit more. Let's translate that notions of tokens into how entries looked at Scylla, okay? So I'm gonna take a partition key, and that's going to be hashed and pushed into one node. Okay? Let's say right now my replication factor is one. If I replicate more, then I will have the same partition on the other nodes as well. The guy who's going to actually hash the information is my driver, the actual driver that writes the data. So he knows the partition key, he knows the hashing algorithm, and so taking the hashing algorithm, creating the new hash, pushing it in, and pushing it to the right node that I want to use. For example, again here, this idea would go to um, node X. Why is it relevant to us? Okay. It's relevant to us because we share the data in a manner that is different than Spark does. Okay. There are differences between the hashing functions uh, between Scylla and Spark. And the main difference is how Spark consumed the data out of Scylla. So let me explain a little bit for the guys who have never used Spark before. Uh, Spark is, again, is a distributed system, okay, that has something that's called uh, the driver program, which is your quote unquote main uh, function, and will take your function and distribute it across multiple executors. Each execu executor will have different tasks and a caching and memory settings that is going to be part of this uh, cluster. The memory is ordered in something that we called, it's called a resilient distributed data set. Okay? And those RDDs are going to be stored in each one of those nodes. The RDDs are, quote unquote, the equivalent, again, to the, ones, to the partitions that we're familiar with Scylla. But there's a big, big difference around it. One more notion here is that Spark actually is a lazy system. It means it will read the data and consume it and will never do anything on top of the data unless we actually do like a transformation on the information or an aggregation on the information. So it's going to store the data, but the actual execution is going to happen just a second before. It's going to try to write the data into the cluster itself. So how it looks like, OK? So let's say I'm going to take, this is my Spark cluster, right? And it has RDDs. It's going to try and read into C, from Scylla partition, uh, from uh, uh, the partition information into the different RDDs. Remember, the RDDs are going to be also distributed across the different nodes. OK? So I'm going to have multiple partitions from Scylla written into multiple nodes of Spark, the executors themselves. One thing that we have to concentrate here is that once when Spark was written, it was written for um, 
quote unquote, a Hadoop file system, which the actual execution unit sits on top of the data. It means that it will store the information that resides in that specific node and read from it. The idea is to minimize the traffic on the network and make it as efficient as possible. But if you remember, uh, with Scylla, it looks a little bit different, right? Because partition key one, partition key two, and partition, partition key n will sit on different nodes in the cluster. So we kind of lost a little bit that connectivity between the Scylla data nodes and the Spark nodes. So that data locality is no longer there from our perspective. When I'm gonna to try to read an RDD, the idea is that when the executor tries to fetch the information from Scylla, it's gonna to try to read a full table. But that table now is stored on different nodes. So you have kind of a gather information process from each one of the um, Scylla nodes. And that's a costly operation. So who managed all that? So there is a Cassandra Spark connector. It was written by the guys at Datastax. Those are the initial contributors. Today there are additional contributors to the, to the product as well. And it will create what we call a Spark context. It will create uh, an, an, an abstraction of the Spark notion inside, the, of the data that is inside Scylla as an abstraction to, for the Spark uh, executors. When it writes information, and I'm just gonna keep this right now in high level, it, when it writes information into Scylla, it writes data in batches. If you're familiar with batches in Cassandra and Scylla, there are some nuances on how you do that correctly. Currently, the, the, the connector is packaged with um, the Java uh, driver. If you um, attended the talks in the morning, you know that we are trying to bring in uh, more efficient drivers into the, into the community to make sure that we are able to connect better between Java application and Scylla. One of the beneficiaries of that type of uh, work is gonna be our Java connector for, uh, for Spark. So how it works when you try to write data. So as I said before, it's gonna batch the information, okay? The first thing it's gonna do, Spark, the Spark con uh, connector will do, is gonna, oops, sorry. It's gonna batch the information inside Spark. So think about it for a second. Let's say I have to write a thousand rows, okay? I'm not gonna start writing to Scylla until I'm gonna get the 1,001 rows. It means that I gotta get a latency backed into the actual connector because this is how it is written. There are ways to, differentiate, to change the actual buffer size. So the default right now uh, is 1,000 1, batch processes. Okay, we'll talk on batch in a minute. And also, it will have another trigger, which is gonna be the actual amount of data you're gonna have in this buffer. So think about it, you're trying to write a lot of data, but right now, an application on side is gonna halt that information until it's gonna get that threshold. The idea behind that is that I want to make sure that I do not overcommit the Scylla node, in that case, the Cassandra nodes, to a more throughput than actually can be uh, sustained by the system. Okay, so I'll have some kind of way to trigger and play the knobs. Another thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna define how many concurrent writes will happen. The default today is five. Okay, so I cannot have more than five concurrent requests or writes into my Scylla cluster from a Spark connector. By the way, all of these are configurable. Okay, so that's something that you want when you actually deploy Spark with Scylla, you want to make sure that you are looking on those parameters on the right side. So again, maximum concurrent default one is gonna be five. The actual buffer size is gonna be a thousand batches that's gonna hold in place before it's gonna actually try to write. And the last thing is how it's gonna actually group the batches. So if you are familiar with Scylla and Cassandra, you know that batches are inefficient when you're trying to batch multiple partition keys or different partition keys in one batch. 
it means that Scylla, when it gets that, that batch, has to go to multiple nodes one by one until it's going to complete the actual write of the information. So you want to make sure that when you do those batches, those batches are going to be referring to a single partition key. So what does the connector does? It offers you multiple strategies on how to batch it. So the default one is by the partition key. However, as, you can, as we saw before, I'm going to do a little bit back flip here. I cannot guarantee that I'm going to have the same partition key for each one of those batches. So now I'm kind of a, uh, in, a, in an unstable situation. So another option is that offered by the Spark connector is doing it by replica. So I'm going to batch it, but now the batch is going to be based on the replica set. So if, for example, I know that all the batch is going to go to node number X, I'm going to have all the batches aligned one after the other to go to that one. And the third one is none. So completely dis uh, disregard the grouping option. And once the batch is ready, that batch command is set is ready, you're going to just send it to all the nodes or all the partitions that are participating in that specific one. Um, one thing that uh, I want to say here is that the maximum size in batch of each one of them is one kilobyte. The default in both Scylla and Cassandra for warning on batches is five kilobytes. So if you're going to change the size of the batch, and there are some use cases that you want to do that, uh, be aware of that, that it actually might collide with your setting in your Scylla YAML. So you're going to start getting warnings on your logs and, or errors, because after you go beyond the five kilobytes, you're going to say it's going to error. And that's going to be painful from your perspective. So please, please make sure that you are aligned uh, between the size of the batches you've defined in your connector and the ones that you actually use inside your system. When, it, when Scylla uh, or the connector writes into um, uh, the Scylla nodes, it's going to use a local quorum. Okay, that's another thing that you have to be aware of. It means that it will ask at least, if you have a replication factor of three, two nodes to acknowledge the write. If you have a very high write throughput, I would argue that you might want to change it to local one to prevent any type of additional latency in the system if you are able to get the throughput from the Spark nodes or you have a lot of Spark nodes. When Spark reads from Scylla, in many cases when you're doing work, uh, you want to do analytics, you have to read your table out of Scylla. And that's, again, something that uh, takes time. What's going to happen is that the Spark connector will look at the table, see how, what's the size. Let's say it has one kilobyte, 1,000 one uh, records, and it's going to be a gigabyte of data. And then it's going to look, OK, how many executors of Spark you have given me to run this job? Let's say I give you 10. So one I'm gonna, now I'm going to take that one gigabyte, OK, and divide it by 10. So I'm going to have 100 megabytes that I'm going to have to fetch for each one of those executors. But then, again, the connector says, wait, wait, that might be too much for, for example, a Cassandra cluster. I want to throttle it or make sure that I don't overcommit the cluster. So the default setting is going to take that RDD or that data and going to chunk it into 64 megabyte reads from the cluster. Now, if you look, and again, this driver was written for Cassandra. If you, it, the, the awareness is a by node, not by shard. If you're going to go and do that by shard from Scylla perspective, it means that now a single shard, a single connection, is going to try to read 64 megabytes. That's going to make it inefficient. Our recommendation is to use a smaller chunk. So yes, you're going to have more reads from the cluster, but each one of them will be hitting a different shard in your cluster. I'm going to get a better concurrency on the read side. One more thing, one additional uh, items that you will see is that you can actually set how many, each one of those fetches, what's the size in the rows. And you can also define, for example, if you have a huge partition and you want to dice it by different rows, you can define that it's going to be 50, 60, or 100 rows. Today, the default is 1,000 rows, and rows, and it's pretty, pretty uh, efficient from that perspective. What we do recommend people is to play around with the input size. Um, 
Additional item that we are constantly being asked is to collocate or not collocate. If you look on other system, they will tell you, hey, put your Spark cluster together with your data cluster. Yes, there is quote unquote efficiencies in that one. You have to, you're gonna be managing less nodes, it's gonna be uh, more efficient from spinning up and down system. You don't have to multiply your controllability control plane. However, there's a cost to that, definitely with a system like Scylla. To make sure that it works, don't forget each one of those Spark nodes have executors. You're gonna define how many cores in each one of your servers are gonna be an executor. For example, let's say we have a 16 node, a 16 core server. I can say I, can say I have eight cores for Scylla and eight cores for, core for the Spark executors. Okay, that's gonna divide that node half and half. Is it efficient? Sometimes it is. If you have a constant analytic workload going in that specific uh, cluster, it might be worthwhile to increase or scale up the node to collocate Spark together with Scylla. However, in our experience, we have seen that in many cases, those workloads that are constantly running are fairly small. So again, the benefit of doing that, it might not be that beneficial. We do recommend um, separating the Spark cluster from the Scylla cluster. You'll have to tune, you have to tune less. You can have a more proficient uh, Scylla cluster to provide you better performance. And you might want to tear down or scale up, scale down your Spark cluster. So the dynamic of actually using the Spark is gonna be more efficient. And this is a Java program at the end of the day, and this one is not. So if you have to manage memory here, if you're gonna set up some kind of a off-hip memory, you have to be considered about the Scylla usage of that specific memory to prevent any type of collisions. So fine tuning, as I said before, um, one thing I didn't say, in the Spark parallelism, there is a setting of how many parallel tasks you want the executor to run. The default, if I remember correctly, is one. On the installation, you can increase it to the number of cores you have in the Scylla side to create more and more parallel connections. Reduce the split size from 64 megabytes to one. There is a setting inside the Cassandra connector that says what's gonna be the maximum connection that I wanna deploy. The default um, is cal calculated by the number of executors you have. We recommend to increase it to the number of cores or more that you have in the Scylla side to open more and more connection. The default number of connections is gonna open, by the way, if you don't have any workload, is one. So the Java connector will open a one connection between your Spark executor and your Scylla nodes. The default concurrent uh, writes, the, the actual writes a batch in flight you can have, the default is five. Again, might make sense to increase that number if you have a very high write, write load. And the concurrent reads for each one of those connection, the default is 512. Makes sense, again, if you need a very high read workload to increase the number. To conclude, uh, so Scylla does enable you to run analytic workloads. And as you saw the presentation this morning from Glober, we're actually gonna improve the processes more and more if you get the, an analytic user that's gonna be able to benefit from a different path of data. And as you said, <coughs> sorry, uh, scanning those tables in a more efficient way. It is recommended from our perspective, if you have some questions about what's the, gonna be the most efficient way to deploy your Spark cluster with Scylla cluster, talk to us. We have found that there are several use cases which are different from one another, and you can get better performance by small tunings in the connector or replacing the Java driver underneath it. And resource management is the key for a performant cluster. It always, time after time after time, we see that if you re your resource management is correct, uh, you size it correctly, both on the Spark side and the Scylla side, you'll be happy with the results. <laughs>